baptism is. Baptism is done for the forgiveness of sins, Acts 2.38. Baptism is done to save us, 1 Peter 3.21, Acts 2.40, Mark 16.16. 16. Baptism is done to wash away our sins, Acts 22.16. Baptism is done to be reborn to new life, John 3.5, Romans 6.3-6. 6, 6. Baptism is done to clothe ourselves with Christ, Galatians 3, 26 and 27. Pastor Booker to you tonight, and this has been the message that I personally wanted to be preached over this pulpit. And I certainly appreciate this man taking time out of his schedule, missing a weekend of his church service which is not easy. Woodlawn, we are blessed. He blessed us today, and and I, I just wanted him to come and share this Bible message. If this was the only night he could be here, uh, it would be worth the while to have him to deliver this message. Be here tomorrow night. Brother Booker is, a we could say, a rising star among the United Pentecostal Church particular in this area 97 he will be preaching the night services at mississippi camp meeting how about that we'll have to wait another year but if the lord tears is coming brother booker will be the night evangelist for our camp meeting but uh, this past thursday night was the first time he said he has preached in mississippi it was through the invitation coming here brother riggins wanted him to come and he came in a little bit early so that he could preach at Powell's Grove. That was his first introduction to Mississippi. And then coming over here and I have enjoyed being with him the last two days or three days. It is just a delightful thing to be around Pastor Booker. And uh, I think I'm a little older than him. I don't know. We haven't really discussed that. He looks older than me but uh, Amen. Great man of God. You will hear much of Brother Booker in time to come. And I want him to come take his liberty and just do whatever he feels to do in the Holy Ghost tonight. And uh, I have prayed much for this service. I want every family to be touched and affected by this message. And I know you will. I heard it this past May. And uh, I'm here to tell you, I've never been the same. Um, my wife and I and our relationship, I think, has been greater since last May. Uh, I hope I've been a better father. I have tried to be. Uh, this man touched me in a way that I have never been touched before. And I'm just so thrilled he's here tonight to share the Bible message with you. The sheer mercies of David. Uh, Come here, Larry, just a minute. He's scared to death, but I'm... Hallelujah! Oh, praise the Lord. Well, it is so very, very good to be in Columbia, Mississippi with your great pastor, his wife, and family, his church family, and the presence of the Lord. And I do feel a very special deep undergirding of the Holy Ghost here tonight. I feel deep waters in the Holy Ghost. And I believe that God wants to do some precious things for us. I don't know. Um, first of all, I want to say to the visitors, God bless you. You are in the right place at the right time. But around here, every time is the right time. And it's always the right place. So we're thrilled, very thrilled that you are here. And I want to say, appreciate the kind reception that we have received from you and the receptivity to the word of the Lord this morning. It is very, very much appreciated, very deeply gratifying. And I do not know who is the sister that that produced the fruit basket. Where are you, sister? Don't be shy. Is that you? 
Oh, sister, you ought to start a business. That was one of the best fruit baskets that I have ever had. I'm telling you, it's just tremendous. And Larry and I are enjoying it very much, I want you to know. And appreciate the kind remarks concerning my son. Have you memorized any verses today? How about yesterday? <laughs> I tell them guys in Mississippi they ain't got a thing to worry about. Praise God. Well, I'm glad my boy's with me, and I'm so glad that everyone is here. I'd like for you to turn with me, if you would, to the book of Psalms, chapter 89. Psalms 89. It is a... Um, it's a rare thing among apostolic preachers to request that a certain message is preached, but it does not bother me in the least, and I have been asked to preach what I'm going to preach to you tonight on several occasions, and it does not bother me. The only thing that bothers me is if perhaps some of you have heard it and, um, you know, for your sakes, I, uh, I I don't know what to tell you. I know you're not supposed to file your nails in church, but if you've already heard it, you might. <laughs> but uh, my, my reason that it does not bother me is that when I preached this message the first time many years ago, many years ago, uh, there was an elder gentleman in our church that was 92 years old at the time. He'd received the Holy Ghost in 1910. He was baptized in Jesus' name in 1915. He was the first secretary of the very first oneness organization in Eureka Springs, Arkansas. And when I preached this the first time, he met me at the back door. I was pastoring 30 people at that time. And he put his hand up on my shoulder, and he said, he said, don't think this message is for this church. He said, you will preach this all over America. And I hugged him and thought that was very sweet of him to say that and make me feel a little better. But uh, he was a, a prophet in more ways than one. So I don't mind being asked to preach this. I want to begin reading at verse 1 of Psalms 89. I will sing of the mercies of the Lord forever. With my mouth will I make known thy faithfulness to all generations. For I have said, mercy, what a beautiful word mercy is. Mercy shall be built up forever. Thy faithfulness shalt thou establish in the very heavens. I have made a covenant with my chosen. I have sworn unto David my servant. Thy seed will I establish forever and build up thy throne to all generations. Verse 24, But my faithfulness, and my mercy shall be with him, and in my name shall his horn be exalted. Verse 28, My mercy will I keep with him forevermore, and my covenant shall stand fast with him. His seed also will I make to endure forever, and his throne is the days of heaven. If his children forsake my law and walk not in my judgments, if they break my statutes and keep not my commandments, then will I visit their transgression with the rod and their iniquity with stripes. Nevertheless, my loving kindness will I not utterly take from him, speaking of David, nor suffer my faithfulness to fail. My covenant will I not break, nor alter the thing that is gone out of my lips. Once have I sworn by my holiness that I will not 
lie unto David. And let us pray and ask that God would indeed anoint every heart tonight. God, we love you. the work of your Holy Ghost, I pray. Do it, God, we beseech you, we love you, we praise you, we worship you. We are the sheep of your fold, God. We ask, God, that the entrance of your word would give light to our lives in Jesus' name. God bless you so very, very much. You may be seated. I want to uh, back up just a little ways and talk about uh, when the Lord first dealt with me about this. Several years ago, I was called upon to uh, help herd a bunch of boys in a youth camp. I was to be the dorm uh, supervisor. My job was to control it and keep them from killing themselves and me in the process. And uh, one night, after the pillow fights and the M&M fights and the sweet tart fights and all other edible, throwable things, and they finally fell to bed exhausted, I lay and looked out the window of the dorm, looked up into the face of the moon, and I really did indeed love those young whippersnappers. And... I began to wonder what the future held for them. You do realize that it is a scary thing to be alive in 1995 in many respects. I wouldn't want to be in this world five minutes without God with me. And I wondered what the future held, and I began to think what would become of them. And at that time I had one son and the other on the way what would become of my little boy and children to come. And as I thought on these things, there was a phrase of Scripture that began to roll through my subconsciousness, trying to work its way to the surface. And it kept going over and over and over until I finally stopped and began to pay attention to it. And when I did, I must confess, I did not know what it meant. But the phrase from Scripture was the sure mercies of David. The sure mercies of David. The sure mercies of David. I came to the place I actually sat up on my bed and wondered uh, what is the sure mercies of David? I went home. I looked up the places where it is found. I read and it did not it did not compute. I didn't, wasn't able to grasp it. But I did take it to the Lord in prayer and ask that He would speak to me. And so, a few months later, I was doing a study on the temple that Solomon built. And I began to look into that vast, luxuriant structure with its 108,000 talents of gold and its 1,017,000 talents of silver, the untold amounts of, of precious stones that went into it. If you were to attempt to build the temple that David, or excuse me, that Solomon built today, you'd be spending somewhere in the neighborhood of 80 to 85 billion dollars. And, uh, and as I read of that great, great project, it, uh, it came through to me in the Word of the Lord that Solomon, his main job simply was to assemble it. The plans, the diagrams, the layout had been given by the Spirit to his father David. The vast amount of finance for the 
structure had already been laid in store by his father David. Of the 108,000 talents of gold, 100,000 had been set aside by his father. And of the 1,017,000 talents of silver, already a million of that had been set aside by his father. So that laid up in store for Solomon was a vast, vast, vast wealth in order to complete the project that was given him. And no doubt his job was made so much easier because of the foresight, the love, the devotion of his father David. To try to attempt that without his father's help would have been a monumental undertaking. I want to say that to try to do anything without your parents' help can be a monumental undertaking. Amen. And I want it to be of my life that my life would be as great a blessing as is humanly and divinely possible for my sons. And if the Lord tarries, their children also. Amen. I read one time a poem that says, Isn't it strange that princes and kings and clowns that caper in sawdust rings and common people like you and me are builders for eternity? Each is given a bag of rules, a book of life, a book of tools. And each must build, ere life is flown, a stumbling block or a stepping stone. Our life, when it comes to our children, is going to be one or two things. There's very rare possibility we will have an ambivalent life concerning the future of our children. Our life will be either a stepping stone to make their going onward and upward an easier climb, or our life will be a stumbling block that if they do make it, they make it in spite of us rather than because of us. I want it to be, and it does not matter to me. And what I'm saying here, I say to my boys publicly, and I say to my boys in private, I do not care if you are preachers or not. Amen. All I want is the perfect will of God for your life. That's all I want for you. And if I can hear somewhere down the road that one of my sons, or two of my sons, or three of my sons, amen, are simply in a church somewhere, and that pastor can come to me and say, I want you to know, amen, your son is a blessing from God, then I will be one happy individual in God. Hallelujah. And I want it to be that my life can be that I've laid up for them something far more precious and something far more important than gold and silver. I want it to be that a life that I've lived and a dedication and a desire and prayer and whatever else by the grace of God, amen, I can muster up. My boys can somehow draw from that and go on and live for God, amen, with a little less luggage than I had to carry when I came to God. Hallelujah. I found in my readings that David, with such foresight and wisdom and understanding, laid up for his house something of far more inestimable value than gold and silver, than treasures of this world where rust and moth are able to corrupt, hallelujah. He laid up in store something that money cannot buy. He laid up in store something that is found in the heavens. It's a treasure that fadeth not away. And I read that to you tonight from the 89th Psalm. He said, mercy shall be built up forever. There was something of David's life. There was something, amen, of his dedication and consecration that God saw, God took note of, God never forgot. And some way is only God can do it. 
He transmuted it, amen, into something laid up into the heavens. Hallelujah, that money cannot buy. And he said, mercy, mercy, mercy. That beautiful word, mercy, shall be built up forever. And he proceeded to say that that mercy would be doled out to his seed after him. Now what is that worth, my friend? Hallelujah. What is it worth to have mercy in your life? How valuable is that mercy that only God can show in a person's life? He said, David, I'm going to tell you, it's like this. If your children commit iniquity, I'm going to chasten them, amen, with the rod of men. Now this, Psalms 89 and the verses that I'm quoting, are almost exactly a direct takeoff of something that God said in 2 Samuel chapter 7. In 2 Samuel 7, He gave it on this wise. He said, Amen, if your children commit iniquity, I will chasten them with the rod of men. And he said, I will not take my mercy from them as I did from he that I put away before thee. Who did he put away before he became king? It was King Saul. What happened to the house of Saul as compared to the house of David? While David's house, if his children committed iniquity, received chastisement, and the Bible said, Whom the Lord loveth, he chasteneth. The Bible tells us in 2 Samuel 3 that while the house of David waxed stronger and stronger, the house of Saul waxed weaker and weaker. You read on through the genealogy, which does not last very long. You read about Jonathan. You read about his two brothers that were slain in battle with their father in the same day. You read about seven other sons that one time were placed upon a hill, nailed to trees because of the father's sins against the Jebusites. Doesn't sound like much mercy ran through the channels of Saul's house. But friend, as you read through the Word of the Lord again and again and again and again, you find God remembering a patriarch by the name of David. You find his descendants. Yes, they committed iniquity. But I'm here to tell you, God showed mercy time and time again. Now I know that I'm at this point in many of your minds, I'm getting way out there on a limb. But it's not an unsupported limb. And we have many scriptures. Hallelujah. In the book of Exodus, chapter 20, we are reading, amen, from the Decalogue. It is the giving of none other than the Ten Commandments. You do not get any more basic than the Ten Commandments. The second commandment, he speaks that He is a jealous God. And He wants no idols, amen, in our lives. And if you want a good definition of an idol, an idol is anything. It doesn't have to be wood or stone, no. amen, that is hewn into the, some kind of an image. An idol is anything that comes between us and God. It can be an individual. It can be a job. It can be anything that comes in between us and God. And so begin reading at verse 5. Thy shall not bow down thyself to them. Don't bow down yourself to that idol. Nor serve them. Don't serve that idol. For I, the Lord thy God, I, the Lord thy God, am a jealous God. I am a jealous God. 
visiting the iniquity of the fathers visiting the iniquity of the fathers upon the children upon the children unto the third and fourth generation unto the third and unto the fourth generation of them that hate me of them that hate me mm. I visit the iniquity of the fathers to the children this is not a chimney corner scripture this is out of the Decalogue this is not something that was given one time I can take you to Exodus 34, and I can take you to Deuteronomy 7, and I can take you to Numbers 14, and show it to you almost verbatim. Time and time again, God's letting it be known that He visits the iniquity of the fathers to the children after them to the third and the fourth generation. In the book of Jeremiah, chapter 32, read verse 18. Thou showest loving kindness unto thou, thousands. Thou, O God, showest loving kindness unto thousands. And recompensest the iniquity of the fathers. And you recompense the iniquity of the fathers into the bosom of into their children. Into the bosom of their children after them. After them. You recompense the iniquity of the fathers into the bosom of their children after them. Now you'll relate to this a little better than Californians do. California is the movingest society in America. It is absolutely crazy and absurd how much people move. We only have maybe three or four families in our whole church that own their homes, everybody rents. They move all the time. I average, I've been there 12 years, we average five people moving, five families moving out a year. They move, they move, they move. Thank God for people praying through. So, you're going to relate to this a little better. Because it tends to be that in the South, people tend to be just a little more rooted. If they move, they don't tend to move far, generally speaking. Have you ever noticed how certain traits run in families? Great-great-grandpa was a horse thief. His boy stole Model T's. His boy stole 32 coupes. His boy stole 56 Chevys, and his boy is in the process of stealing Corvettes tonight. And we call them packs of thieves, and we know where they live. Isn't it something how the traits go down from generation to generation? That does not mean that everybody's going to be like that. But if they're not, it's because, honey, somewhere they pin their ears back and they break out of it. And they say, I don't care what daddy's like, I'm not going to be like him. And they have to shed the luggage. Amen. And I'm going to tell you something, that's a whole lot easier said than done. Amen. We're living in a generation. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to say some things here. There's not a family here. But what is very probably affected by this somewhere, the society, the fabric of America is slowly, surely, inexorably deteriorating. Now, this, everybody in California relates to this. There's not a family here probably, but what somewhere, your family's been touched by drugs. If not immediate, secondary, third, cousins or something. And you've seen the devastation. Alcohol, you've seen it. Immorality, you've seen it. So we're living in a society where these things are happening. But I'm going to tell you something, and hear me well. Some of these things, you've been around long enough, they become common traits in families. They run from generation to generation. 
almost like wild, untamed horses. And the devastation that is wrought. He said, I will visit the iniquity of the fathers to the children, to the third and fourth generation of them that hate me. I will recompense the fathers, amen, by putting their iniquity into the bosom of their children after them. Now, I never saw my dad that I know of. My real father. The closest that I'm aware that I ever got to him. There was a time I thought it was a father that pressed two dollars in my hands, but it turned out it wasn't. It was an uncle. The closest I ever got to my real father, to my knowledge, was when I stood over his grave. And he... A man is buried in Wells Point, Texas. And that little backwater community there at Wells Point, I stood over his grave. He died at 46 years of age at a massive heart attack. But he had drank one quart of whiskey a day for the last 10 years of his life. My dad was a fighter. My dad was a brawler. My dad was a scrapper. My dad went from job to job, pillar to post. And, and he did me, my mother, and our family dirty. He was the untalked about subject of all my days. I didn't even know his name till I was over 21 years old. Nobody talked about my dad. One day, when I'd been in trouble, as had been my custom, on probation, from the time I was 15. I'm sorry, I was not raised in this truth. Amen. I was on probation from the time I was 15 till I was 21. I was in and out of jail. I had psychiatrists try to help me, and psychologists try to help me, and doctors try to help me, and lawyers try to help me, and policemen, good and bad, try to help me. I had school principals and teachers, and, and they, they did everything from try to pray my way through college. Uh, you name it, you name it, you name it, you name it, you name it. And somehow it would never work. And uh, one day, when they'd sprung me from jail, one more time, and I was sitting on the couch, I guess I pushed a dear aunt over the brink. And she came out of her chair, and she put her finger in my face. And she began to talk about the unmentionable. You are just like your father. You walk like Him. You talk like Him. You act like Him. You drink like Him. You fight like Him. You run around like Him. And when she caught herself, she sat back down. That was my introduction to anything about my father. I'd never been around him. But I acted and I lived just like Him. And I was not raised that way. Amen. But one day, but one day, but one day, I found my way to a Pentecostal altar. And I began to find the blood of Jesus Christ be poured out on me through my repentance and my baptism in Jesus name and the infilling of the Holy Ghost that was given unto me and if you please I got a new daddy hallelujah and I got a new name and I got a new promise and I got a new hope old things were passed away behold all things were become new hallelujah amen and I begin to find amen as I would live for God. And I've determined by God's grace and by His promises the struggles that I had even after I came to God and I'll explain that in a minute by the grace of God my boys will never have to struggle with those things I'm passing on something better than was passed on to me there are some sure mercies amen that I believe are being laid up in heaven tonight Hallelujah! Amen. There is good news to this, but there is bad news. In the book of Job, chapter 21. Who's got that? Read verse 17. 
How oft is the candle of the wicked put How out? How often is the candle of the wicked put out? How often cometh their destruction upon them? How often comes destruction upon the wicked? Now I'm going to tell you something. It'd be one thing. If the wicked just lived their wicked lives and they paid through it through the teeth and that was it. But it doesn't stop there. No man is an island. Mm. Nobody lives and dies unto themselves. Verse 19. God layeth up His iniquity for His children. God. It's not enough. Mm. God lays up His iniquity for His children. He rewardeth him and he shall know it. He's going to reward him and he's going to know he's been rewarded. Now I'm going to tell you something. That is out of the book of Job, which is prior to the law, which is prior to the Ten Commandments. And that's not Elihu or Eliphaz or Bildad speaking, honey. That's Job. And God said what he spake concerning me was right. Amen. Hosea chapter 4. Read verse 6. My people are destroyed for My the lack of knowledge. People are destroyed for a lack of knowledge. Because they has rejected knowledge. Because thou hast rejected knowledge. I will also reject thee. I will also reject thee, which is bad enough. But it doesn't stop there. That thou shalt be no priest to me. Read. Seeing thou hast forgotten the law of thy God. You've forgotten the law of thy God. I will also forget thy children. I'll forget your children. If there ever was a God-forgotten lot, Amen. God said to Saul, Because thou hast rejected the word of the Lord, God has rejected thee. But he wasn't the only one that was rejected. Saul's children were rejected. Amen. You say, I don't think that's so. Well, you're right. It wasn't so in all of them. There was a son of Saul that he didn't act like Saul. He didn't think like Saul. He didn't live like Saul. And he determined, I'm going another route. Hallelujah. And his name was Jonathan. Now he suffered. He died the same day Saul did. But my Bible tells me he had a boy that received mercy. And that boy's name was Mephibosheth. And one day this crippled boy that had been crippled as a fall, running when he was a child, away because of the sins of Saul. My Bible lets me know one day Jonathan, amen, though he was dead, David lifted up his head and he said, Is there anybody left of the house of Jonathan that I can show mercy to? And next thing you know, Mephibosheth was at the king's table, eating the king's food. Amen. Having the king's mercy bestowed upon him. And it wasn't because of his grandpa Saul. It was because of his father Jonathan that said, I will order my affairs different than my father. Thank God there is good news. He visits the iniquity of the fathers to the children, to the third and to the fourth generation of them that hate Him. That's the reason you find generational curses. When Joab killed Abner at the gate in the funeral procession at his bear, amen, the Bible tells us, David said, let there not come one from the house of Joab. But what he is crippled, or beggeth, or lacketh bread forever. That is the reason when Noah woke out of his sleep, he said, Cursed be Canaan. Ham's his disrespectful son's child. Amen. That is the reason when Gehazi, he took the wedge of silver and gold and the garment from Syrian, the Naaman, the, the Syrian, that had been healed of his leprosy. That is the reason that Elisha said, Naaman's leprosy be on thee and thy seed forever. I'm going to tell you something. We need to get a crystal clear revelation. And he said, I am the Lord and I do not change.
The Bible says He is the same yesterday, today, and forever. And we need to get a crystal clear revelation. I'm not living for myself alone. I've got babies involved. I've got sons and daughters. If the Lord tarries, I've got grandkids. God, let me order my affairs according to Your Word, according to Your Spirit. I want the blessings of God to be on me and on my house. He said He visits them in the iniquity of the fathers and then unto the children to the third and to the fourth generation of them that hate Him. But there's a flip side. Thank God for good news. Hallelujah. Read the rest. Read verse 6 of Exodus 20. Amen. I'll, I'll quote it. And showing mercy unto the thousands of them. that love me and such as keep my commandments iniquity goes to the third and fourth generation but my mercy will go unto the thousands of them it's like where sin doth abound grace doth much more abound and if iniquity can travel three to four generations, His truth will endure to a thousand generations. Hallelujah. There's just something about mercy. He said it will be built up in the heavens forever and ever and ever and ever. His anger endureth but for a moment. But in His favor is life. Hallelujah. And if iniquity grieves Him, that lets us know how much He rejoices over righteousness hallelujah the good news the good news the good news god remembers the righteousness of his people hallelujah that's the reason it says in in ephesians 6 amen knowing that whatsoever good thing any thing whatsoever good thing any man doeth the same shall he receive from the lord you sow you're going to reap God is faithful. He will not forget your work and your labor of love. And what greater blessings than to see the mercies of God bestowed upon your family. Hallelujah. Now some are saying right now, Whoa! You're saying you live for God and your kids are automatically swept into heaven. No, 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 no. No. We're free moral agents. God will never take that away from anybody. I'm on my way to heaven because the Spirit drew me and I responded to Him. Hallelujah. And I'm just going to throw this in. Anything I am or you are or I have or you have, you have because you responded. That's all we've got is an ability to respond. God will never take our free moral agency from us. Amen. If my son Larry Andy makes it to heaven, it will be because he responds to the same God I respond to. Hallelujah. He'll have to make up his mind just like I've had to make up my mind. Amen. 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 But I do know this. That if I live for God, somewhere, someplace, sometime, humanity being humanity, my boys are going to need mercy. They're going to need mercy on them. Oh God, remember my boys. Oh God, remember my children. Oh God, let the mercies of God be on my family. That's why David said, Oh God, when you bring judgment, remember mercy. And he never forgot. God forbid. One of my children of the Lord Terry. One of my grandchildren. Might be in a bar somewhere, someplace. Where I couldn't go. I couldn't reach. God, remember me. And go where I cannot go. And reach where I cannot reach. And talk where I cannot talk. And show mercy where it's beyond my ability. If need be, work it like you did with Abraham. 
when the Scripture said, Amen, God remembered Abraham and delivered Lot. He, those angels took Lot by the hand and his wife by the hand. God, amen, those angels led them out of the city. Why? The Bible said God remembered Abraham. God remembered Abraham. God remembered Abraham! And He delivered Lot! Hallelujah. I just want something laid up in the heavens that God will remember. Hallelujah. That's why the book of Psalms Chapter 18, read verse 50. Great deliverance. Great deliverance. Giveth he to his king. Giveth he to his king. And showeth mercy. And showeth mercy. To his anointed. To his anointed. To David. To David. And to his seed and forever. And to his seed forever. <laughs> I'm going to show mercy, David, to you and to your seed forever. Psalms 103, verse 17. But the mercy of the Lord is from but everlasting. The mercy of the Lord from everlasting. is from everlasting to everlasting. Upon them that fear Him. Upon them that fear Him. And His righteousness, and his righteousness unto children's children. Unto children's children. Luke chapter 1, verse 50. This is not just Old Testament. And his mercy, and his mercy is on them, is on them that fear him, that fear him from generations to from generation, generation to generation. Second Timothy chapter one, Paul is writing to his son in the gospel. His name is Timotheus or Timothy. He's writing. He's penning. He's thinking of this young man. His verity and his faith. Verse 5. When I call to remembrance. Oh, Timothy. When I call to remembrance. The unfeigned faith. The unfeigned. That real, beautiful, pure, simplistic faith that is in thee. Is in thee. Which dwelt first. I remember. It dwelt first in thy grandmother Lois. It was first in your grandmother, grandmother. Lois. And thy mother. And then I remember that this unfeigned faith that's in you, it was then in your mother Eunice. Eunice. And I am persuaded. And I'm persuaded that in thee also. It's in thee also. Now don't tell me that Lois didn't lay up something for Eunice. And don't tell me that Eunice didn't lay up something for Timotheus. And don't tell me the apostle didn't recognize it. Hallelujah. For what it was. This is something, boy, I suggest you keep in mind. I'm remembering, and you better do the same. It started in your grandma, and then it went to your mother. And though his mother was a Jew and his father was a Greek, he was carried through a mama that said, I will live for God. Hallelujah. I will live for God. It doesn't matter if daddy don't do it. It doesn't matter, daddy, if mama don't do it. You've got children. I'm going to live for God. I'm going to lay up something for my babies. I'm going to do it! And God's going to see. And God is going to remember. Hallelujah. Let's lift our hands and love Him. I love you, my God. I love you, my God. I love you, my God. Oh, Jesus! I love you, Lord. Did you ever notice when Jeroboam, raised up by God, set up the golden calves each end of the kingdom, when the prophet came, he said, your seed will continue to the fourth generation. 
when Jehu, starting out so zealously, ended up betraying the truth of his God, God said, four generations. When Omni pulled his shenanigans, murderous, treacherous fiend that he was, four generations and he was finished honey I'm glad for God that says there's mercy that'll be built up to all generations to the thousands of them there's many places I could take you to the word of the Lord David died Solomon his son began to reign he started out so gloriously. We won't take the time, but in Second Chronicles 6, and you may think I'm overreading into this, Solomon in that chapter offers the longest prayer you find anywhere in the Word of God. He has built the temple. To build it today, again, 80 to 85 billion dollars. 1,017,000 talents of silver, 108,000 talents of gold. It took 150,000 men seven years to assemble it. 10,000 men 11 years just to cut the lumber to put it together. When they had the Feast of Dedication, the Bible tells us, Amen. That from Solomon's flocks, not the people of Israel. The Bible said all of the animals that were offered up that day said could not be counted nor numbered for multitude. But what Solomon gave out of his own personal flocks could be counted and numbered. 20,000 oxen and 120,000 sheep. One man's offering. And in the middle of it, he gives the longest, most beautiful prayer in the Bible he starts on his feet and he ends on his knees he says God when we're put to flight against the enemies let us look towards this place and pray if drought comes upon us and feminine pest, famine and pestilence let us look to this place and pray when the stranger comes into our coast let him look to this house to pray and on and on and on it's beautiful, it's precise, nothing happens. And then at the end, he starts talking to God about a man that had been dead for 11 years. And it's like he said, by the way, God, remember the mercies of my father David and it was the last words he got out of his mouth the Shekinah the glory of God fell into that place to where the priest could not minister could it be that when he brought up that man dead and in the grave he plucked a heartstring of God, of a man after his own heart. Hallelujah. And God remembered that man. And God indeed remembered the mercies of that dead patriarch David and poured out his glory. This I do know in 1 Kings chapter 11. His son is on the throne now. David's been dead at least 23 years. Verse 1. But King Solomon loved many strange women. But King Solomon! His heart did not go after God as the heart of David his father. And he loved many strange women. Verse 6. And Solomon did evil in the sight of the Lord. And he did evil in the sight of the Lord. And he went not fully after the Lord as he, David his father. He didn't live like David lived. He didn't go fully after God like David right. did. So verse 11. Wherefore the Lord said unto Solomon. So God had a message for that young man. For as much this is done of thee. Because you've done this. Thou hast not kept my covenant and my statutes. 
which I have commanded thee, I will surely rend the kingdom from thee and will give it unto thy servant. Because of what you've done, I'm tearing the kingdom from you. That is my judgment. Then something plucked his heart. Oh, yes, it did. And he couldn't forget. He told David, he swore of a truth, and he said, I won't turn from it. If your kids commit iniquity, I'll chasten them, but I'll not utterly take my mercy from them as I did from Saul that I put away before you. Read on. Notwithstanding. Notwithstanding. In thy days. In your day. I will not do it for I'm day. I'm not going to do it. Not because you're a good old boy. Not because you deserve it. I'm not going to do it in your day. Because. For David thy father's sake. For David. I'm showing you mercy. Because it's been built up in the heavens forever. I'm showing you mercy. Because of David. Your father's sake. Amen. So read on. Brother. 15. Yes. 12. No, no, no. No, no. Where, where you were. Okay. Chapter 11. Read on from that verse. How be it? Verse 12. Yes. Notwithstanding in thy days, I will not do it for David thy father's sake. Now listen to But close. I will rend it out of the hands of thy son. You have passed on something to your son that was not passed on to you. I won't do it in your day because of David, your father's sake. So I'm going to do it in the days of your son. Read. How be it? How be it? I will not rend it away all the kingdom. I'm not going to take away the entirety of the kingdom. But will give one tribe. I'm going to give him one tribe. To thy son. To your boy. For David, my servant's sake. Because I just can't forget David. And I'm not going to take it even from your son. Not because of you, Solomon. But I'm remembering mercy. I'm remembering mercy in the midst of my judgment. In chapter 15, now David has been dead well over 56 years. Solomon's gone. His son has come on the scene and he is gone. Now his son Abijah. This is the great grandson of David. Verse 1. Now in the 18th year the king Jeroboam... The son of Nebath reigned Abijam over Judah. Abijam is reigning. Read. Three years reigned he in Jerusalem. And his mother's name was Michael, the daughter of Abishalom. And he walked in all the sins of his father. Abijam walked in all the sins of Rehoboam his father and Solomon his father. Which he had done before him. Which he had done before him. His heart was not perfect with the Lord his God. His heart was not perfect with the Lord his God. As the heart of David his father. As the heart of David his great grandfather. Nevertheless. Nevertheless. For David's sake. For David's sake. Did the Lord his God. Did the Lord his God. Give him a lamp in Jerusalem. Give him a lamp in Jerusalem. To set up his son after him. He did it for two reasons. David his great grandfather's sake. And Esau his son's sake after him. Brother Carney. I've seen people receive mercy because of their kids. That's pretty sorry. When kids, when a man is spared so God can raise up his kids after him. But he said, you just happen to be caught in between two mercies, brother. I ought to bring it all down on your head. But I can't forget your father, and I'm going to remember your boy after you. My, my, my. I'd hate to be, I'd hate for it to be that my kids would be used in spite of me. Oh, 
I want to make this thing easier for my family. I want to be a blessing. Hallelujah. I, I want this thing to flow as sweet as sugar. Hallelujah. We could go on. I could tell you, show you a place where David is in the grave 106 years. I could show you a place where he's in the grave 124 years. And yet God is never forgetting. It's went past the third generation. It's went past the fourth generation. It's went past the fifth, the sixth, the seventh generation. In Second Kings chapter 19, amen, David has been in the grave 305 years. And he's got a descendant on the throne by the name of Hezekiah. And Hezekiah is surrounded by the Assyrian army. And Sennacherib, the king of Assyria, has sent his little dandies to stand outside, curse God, mock the king. And he gets a letter. And he takes the letter. And he lays it in on the altar. And he prays to his God that God would have mercy. Verse 32. Therefore, thus saith the Lord concerning the king of Assyria. So God gave him an answer concerning the king of Assyria. He shall not come into this city. Hezekiah, the Syrians, the Assyrians are not coming into this city. Nor shoot an arrow there. The Assyrians are not going to shoot an arrow in this city. Nor come before it with shield. The Assyrians are not going to come before it with a shield. Nor cast a bank against it. They're not going to cast an embankment against it. By the way that he came. By the way he came. By the same shall he return. He's gone home again. And shall not come into this city, now saith the Lord. good news for Hezekiah. But keep reading. For I will defend this city to save it for mine own sake. I've got some things in stake here. And there's some reasons I'm sparing at Hezekiah. One is for my sake. But it goes beyond that. And it's deeper than that. I'm in the heavens. And there's something been built up here forever. It was established 305 years ago. And I'll never forget it. I'm doing this. I'm showing this. I'm giving this mercy for my sake. And for my servant David's sake. And I'm doing it for my servant David's sake. I want you all to hear me. Brother Carney, Judgment Day, when all hidden things are brought to light, it's going to be an amazing thing. I'd like to see the hands of everybody in here that you are a first generation Pentecostal. In other words, you were not raised in the truth. Raise your hands. Keep them up. Please keep them up. Brother Carney, that's a testimony. And I'm going to say this and we'll say it right. I've been to several churches in the South, not Mississippi. I was in a church one time. Monster. Four people raise their hands. It's a testimony. These many, these many people in this church are brand new people. First generation Pentecost. You hear me? That's fabulous. First generation. Your mom wasn't in it. Your dad wasn't in it. Brother. You can lower them. God bless you. Judgment Day is going to be something. Wouldn't it be something when we stand up yonder and the awards, the crowns are given that back in 1691 305 years ago in your family tree some old saint was baptized in Jesus' name, full of the Holy Ghost, loved this God, served this God, 
I don't know the name. You don't know the name. We don't even know that they exist. But Judgment Day, brother, wouldn't it be something that God never forgot, never forgot, never forgot? What's your first name? And 305 years later, God said, you know what? I just ain't going to forget. Amen. Sister Elizabeth back yonder. And here's Jim. And it's 305 years. But there's been some mercy built up forever. Hallelujah. You hear me? It pays to live for God. You hear me? My God knows. My God sees. He is mindful. He will not forget your work and your labor of love. Hallelujah! Hallelujah! It means something to say, God, I'm going to be a stepping block, not a stumbling stone. Hallelujah! It's going to be easier because of me, by the grace of God, than in spite of me. Hallelujah! Amen. I'm going to read something to you. Some may be thinking, Sister, could you come? Some may be thinking, well, that's nice and fine and well, but that's just, that's just, you know. No. It's not Old Testament solely, it's a promise. With the Carney Isaiah 55, verse 1. Ho, everyone that thirsteth, everyone that thirsteth, come ye to the waters. Come ye to the waters. He that has no money, you don't got any money, come ye. Come on. Buy and eat. Buy and eat. Yea, come. Come on. Buy wine and milk. Wine and milk. Without money. Without money. And without price. Where are you going to find a deal like that? <laughs> Read. Wherefore. Wherefore. Do you spend money. Do you spend money. For that which is not bread. For that which is really not bread. And you labor. And you labor. For that which satisfieth not. For those things that leave you just as empty as before. You're not satisfied, sir. Mm -mm. Ma'am, you're just as empty as you always were. Yes. But read. Hearken diligently unto me. But if you'll hearken to me. And eat ye that which is good. Eat ye that which is good. And let your soul delight itself in fatness. Let your soul Delight itself in fatness. Incline your ears. Incline your ears. And come unto me. Come unto me. Here. Here. And your soul shall live. Your soul is going to live. And I. And I. Will make an everlasting covenant with you. Will make an everlasting covenant with you. With you and 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 you, it's the whosoever will. I will make an everlasting covenant with you. Anybody that hears, anybody that inclines, anybody that delights. Read. Even the sure mercies of David. I'll do for David, sir. Yes. I'll do for you, sir, what I did for Dave. I'll do it. I won't forget you any more than I could forget David. I won't forsake you any more than I ever forsook Dave and his seed forevermore. Do you understand in the New Testament when Jesus Christ rose out of the grave that the apostle said that was part of the sure mercies of David. Read it for yourself. Even the resurrection. I just can't forget David. I'm going to read something to you. I'm almost done. 
the state of New York had a social worker worked in various branches of government social work with people he took it upon himself to do a study of a family that had lived in the confines of New York State since the days they'd been keeping records he studied two families this first was named Max Jukes Max Jukes was a lowlife Max was a drunkard Max was a thief and Max married a woman of like character from the Jukes family there came through the centuries up till present day 1026 descendants of that number 300 died prematurely 150 were known criminals with well, a hundred of them spending an average of 13 years each in New York penitentiaries 17 of those were murderers scores of the women were public prostitutes and God only knows who was in private there was over 100 habitual drunks 310 died absolute stark poverty and the Jukes family has cost the state of New York one million two hundred and fifty thousand dollars in dealing with this family the social worker studied another family that has its roots back in the early days of record-keeping of New York approximately the same time there lived a man by the name of Jonathan Edwards who was an itinerant preacher of what I would simply call a preacher of righteousness he had a revival of great, deep, thorough repentance. Jonathan Edwards married a woman of like character. They had, from that union through the centuries, 1,029 descendants from the Edwards family were produced, and some of these overlap. 300 preachers, 65 college professors, 13 university presidents, 60 authors of books, three U.S. congressmen, 30 judges, 295 college graduates, 80 public officials, 75 Army, Navy officers, 60 physicians, 100 lawyers, and the only quote-unquote black sheep they had of the family was a vice president of the United States by the name of Aaron Burr, who was Jonathan Edwards' grandson. And they never cost the state of New York one penny. Don't tell me Max Jukes did not lay up something for his family. And don't tell me Jonathan Edwards did not lay up something for his family. And don't tell me you and I will not lay up something for our family. Amen. Now I'm going to tell you about the first time I ever preached this message. And the old brother told me I'd preach it all over America. It was on a Sunday morning. Let's stand. Let's stand. The children were in the Sunday school. In those days at the end of that class, we'd have the children come in and be with the parents. We'd have a worship time and then we'd dismiss. We was just about here in this message. And the kids started to come out the side door and I said, Stop! Stop the kids. Shut the door. Keep them back. I said, moms and dads, when your babies come marching through this morning, I want you to look at them with a new eye, new understanding. And as your babies come to your side, I want us to do some self-examination. 
What am I laying up for my babies? Is it sure? Is it steadfast? Is it loyal? Is it solid? Is it true? Amen. And so, I said, come on. And the kids began to come. Kids weren't in service. They didn't know what was going on. They're just, they're skipping and looking and smiling and grinning. They don't. Moms and dads are watching their babies come. Two little boys, brothers, begin to make their way. As they did, my eyes fell on them. And I couldn't remove them. I watched them. I was drawn to them. I stared. And as they walked by, the Lord spoke to me. He called their mother's name. I'll call it Suzanne. He said, Suzanne does not love her children. And I said, whoa, that was not God. Because if I had to pick the best mother in that church next to my wife, I would have chose her. They never sniffed, but what mama was there. Their shoes were polished. Their clothes, I mean, they were immaculate. They were just... But I was troubled. I was deeply troubled. We lived catty corner from the church, and, and I went home. My wife had been sitting right there at service front row. And we walked into the house. She said, I need to tell you something. I said, well, I, I got something on my mind I want to talk to you about. She said, well, I, I really need to tell you. I said, well, I do too. She said, it's about service this morning. And I said, well, mine is too. She said, she said, Larry, I want to tell you something. I said, what? She said, you know when you had the kids come in? I said, yes. She named those two brothers. She said, honey, when they walked in front of me, the Lord spoke to me and said, Suzanne does not love her children. And I knew now that it was indeed God. But I didn't know what it meant. But now I know. Four months later, Suzanne walked out of church, never come back. She's a cocaine addict today. Her boys are grown. Their lives are messed up. They're out of church, been for years and years. And whether you're ready or not for this, I'm going to tell you anyway. From that point on, I knew. Backsliders do not, I repeat, do not love their children. You say, that ain't fair. It ain't fair for you not to live for God. It ain't fair for you to expect them to carry your luggage of sin and shame. It's not fair! They didn't ask to be brought into this world! You say, I didn't either. Yeah, but you're old enough now to do something about it. And say, God, I don't want to just love them now. I don't want to just love them at Christmas time. I want to prove my love is eternal. I want to live for you, God. So that, come what may, you can show mercy when and where you can. When and where you can. When and where you can. Brother Carney, I preached this message in Hayward, California. 
Brother Lehman Reynolds, he was a patriarch among us. Built eight churches. It was about three quarters of the way through, he started weeping. He started sobbing. He just sobbed and wept. At the end of service, he grabbed me. He pulled me to him. He said, Brother Booker, he said, my oldest boy, Mark, he said he's never lived for God. Said he said, he just never did it. He said, here, a few years ago, he was in a, he was in a business van, and, and, he, and he was going on an on-ramp, and he was going too fast, and he went off the on-ramp, headlong out into space. The van turned, it landed on its top, and slid over a hundred yards. He said, my boy walked out of that. When I went to the hospital to see him, and the doctor said it was an absolute miracle and he'd be out in just a few days. As I was leaving his room, he said, Brother Booker, the Lord spoke to me and said, Lehman, I didn't spare Mark for his sake. I spared him for your sake. I was preaching this in Bellflower, California. Sister White began to weep. She began to sob. She began to cry. Her boy, God love him, has lived like the devil all his life. He was in a horrible car wreck. He should have been dead. She was in the hospital day and night praying. Till finally, God intervened. He knew it. God knew it. The hospital knew it. She knew it. Spared his life. And as she was thanking God, he said, Lillian, I didn't spare him for his sake. I spared him for your sake. That boy's never lived for God, but he produced a son. That's pastor in a church today, and he's a fine young man. God remembered his grandma. God. I don't understand it all. I don't know all the ins and the outs. I just know there's enough here to convince me. It pays to live for God in many, many, many more ways than one. And I want to live for God if no other reason for the sake of my babies. In Jesus' name. Jesus' name. 
I think it would be very good. Every mother, every husband, every father, every son, every daughter, it doesn't matter how old, whole families, grandparents, sons, grandkids. Trust in the Lord with all your heart, and lean not into your own understanding. In all your ways acknowledge Him, and He shall direct your path. Baptism, then what? Baptism is a burial in water for accountable beings unto the remission of sins, for salvation to get into Christ, to become a new creature, to get into the one body. Then walk in the new life, study and grow. Become a servant of righteousness. Keep self pure. Be an example. Have faith in God. Follow Jesus. Put first things first. Resist temptation. Be faithful and be fruitful. <laughs> 